Welcome to Plenary 9 of the 2022 International Conference on Sustainable Development. I'm going to hand it over to our moderator, Maria Cortes Puch, Head of Networks at SDSN, to kick us off. Thank you very much, Lauren. Um, uh, next year in September 2023, during the General Assembly Week in New York, so exactly the same week that we're in uh, right now, the second SDG summit will take place. Uh, this summit is going to mark the midpoint of the implementation of the 2030 agenda. And sadly, uh, as you probably all have seen in our sustainable development report this year, uh, the world is nowhere near to achieving these goals. In fact, the multifaceted crisis that we are immersed in, the pandemic, the climate emergency, as well as armed conflicts, have become major setbacks in achieving uh, these SDGs globally. Furthermore, we see how the most vulnerable um, around the world are at, highest, are at higher risks of suffering the impacts of this crisis. Um, as the COVID-19 Lancet Commission stated, the pandemic has brought to light, but also further exacerbated many of the existing social, economic, and political inequalities. And today we're also seeing how the most vulnerable are exper experiencing the worst consequences of the climate emergency and uh, side effects of the armed conflicts. As many have pointed out, uh, one of the barriers of achieving uh, these goals is that much of the SDG related action focuses on small um, incremental change projects. Um, they touch upon very specific component of a wider system that is in itself unsustainable. Um, Often what we're seeing is that countries, cities, and organizations are trying to address sustainable development challenges as a question of optimizing what we're already doing, uh, making it more efficient or improving this particular aspect. Um, instead of really reimagining a whole new way of doing things. And it's important to identify which are the policies and the trajectories that can lead to really transformative change that can lead us to an uns as a sustainable system. At the Sustainable Development Solutions Network, as well as at our partner uh, institution, GIZ, we place a huge value in the principle of leaving no one behind. In our, in our work on the six transformations to achieve the SDGs, we posit that it is this principle that needs to underpin all policy design. It requires uh, identifying and addressing the needs of the most vulnerable from the outset. And it also requires ensuring that all investments in services, in infrastructure and technologies promote equity. So SDSN and GIZ have partnered to develop several initiatives that focus specifically on advancing the LNOV, the leave no one behind principle. We started off last year by hosting uh, a bar camp. Uh, it's, it's a very interesting experience where we invited members from around the world to present ideas that could then be further developed through a process of co-designing. Um, we had members of 40 different countries and uh, the help of our LNOB ambassadors, uh, as well as many other experts that helped improve those processes. Uh, this year, we've done something else. We've awarded three research grants to uh, conduct research on different angles of the LNOB principle. Um, and we focused specifically on why this principle is important when designing sustainable development policies and also recovery uh, strategies, recovering from the pandemic, from the current crisis. The teams awarded come from the SDSN Mexico, the SDSN Pakistan, and the SDSN South Africa. And today we're thrilled to have a discussion with them to learn from their work and some of the insights that are coming out from this research. Before I give the floor to our fantastic keynote speaker, uh, Martha Bekele, who was uh, one of our LNOB ambassadors last year, allow me to express my gratitude to uh, GIZ for the many years of partnerships that has helped uh, shape what SDSN is. Um, and we are an organization of 1,700 member institutions in more than 100 countries. 
but also uh, my gratitude goes very specifically to the team at GIZ, to Nina, to Barbara and Eva for their leadership and their diligence uh, throughout these months uh, in this work and many other projects that we're doing together. And of course, to BMZ for their support over the years. So without uh, further ado, I'm handing the floor to uh, Martha Bekele, who will be uh, making our keynote speak speech right now. Thank you, Maria. Uh, I will have a few slides. Uh, but before that, hi, everyone. As Maria said, my name is Martha Begala. I work for Development Initiatives, that is DI, a global organization that harnesses the power of data and evidence in development. For those of you who are not able to see me for some reason, I am a Black African woman. Uh, I am wearing a white shirt and uh, a blue jacket. So that is that is part of leaving no one behind. Um, so what I would want to do now is uh, share my slides. There are very few, I promise. Um, yeah, here we go. Okay, so I want to speak to you today about common challenges that have differentiated impacts on those that are vulnerable. And I will also want to speak on the vital role of data in the conversation of leaving no one behind. The premise is here being not everyone is affected equally uh, by the ongoing world crisis such as the Russia-Ukraine war and climate change. The furthest behind are often the most vulnerable to the adverse effects of national and global decisions and actions. In short, we may have common and compound challenges, but the impacts are different on different sections of the society. The consequences of the, the geopolitical Russia-Ukraine crisis are felt by the poorest, thousands of miles away. And this comes immediately after COVID-19. Uh, and also we are experiencing, for instance, in the Horn of Africa, the worst climatic event in 40 years. Um, and households are left with starvation. If you look at the data, we have, um, people who are not able to afford basic food items as food prices in Ethiopia, for instance, have increased by 66% and in Somalia, 36%. The other element that I would want to touch on is women and children are affected disproportionately compared to the general uh, population. Uh, for example, on the on, because of the ongoing Horn of Africa drought crisis, we have gender-based violence. Studies are indicating that children, particularly girls, have been dropping out of school while gender-based violence um, has uh, doubled, almost doubled. It is 97% in one refugee camp alone in Kenya. Uh, and despite having no stake or a role, the economic impact of the Russia-Ukraine conflict on Africa is devastating. According to the Africa Economic Outlook 2022, for instance, 1.8 million Africans are pushed, could be pushed to extreme poverty as a result of this crisis. And this number is expected to increase to 2.1 million by 2023. So you can imagine the ability to recover quickly and protect vulnerable households is dependent on the strength of existing social safety net programs and as you know, typically in Africa, for instance, uh, safety net uh, programs consist many small but fragmented uh, programs in Africa. Hence the challenge the continent continues to face as a result of the conflict between Russia and Ukraine, the mounting public debt and inflation is compounded by climate change where there is an estimation that Africa is losing it has been losing 5% to 15% of its uh, gross domestic product per capita growth. 
Now, I would want to speak uh, specifically about climate change impacts and uh, particularly transition to uh, clean energy. I know one of the panelists is going to discuss this later, but for now, I just want to ask if what we have is a win-win for everyone. everyone. Now, we know there is a consensus, a general consensus that nations need to move uh, to, to, to clean energy economy, which is okay. But the speed, the scope, and the form of transition is highly contentious. Why? Because, for instance, job created in one district as a result of this transition may not necessarily be created in the same district where jobs are, uh, are, are, are lost um, because of that reform. The other is, I, I want to bring in the case of Nigeria, what happened in Nigeria. So as you know, one reform many countries are implementing is phasing out the use of dirty burning fuels, such as household kerosene. In Africa, household kerosene is used uh, as a primary source of energy for heating, for cooking, for lighting. And as countries move to cutting fuel subsidies, urban dwellers, especially those that are living in slums and rural communities feel the pinch as the price of household kerosene increases year on year. So there is an example here that I have put. According to the National Bureau of Statistics of Nigeria, within just one year, the average retail price per liter of household kerosene paid by consumers in July 2022 increased by 99% compared to the previous year. So in the absence of easily accessible and affordable alternatives, the impact of rising prices of primary sources of unclean energy is significant. And there is a report by the Center for, uh, Center for Global Development, that is CGD. And what they reported is that unlike in India and Iran, Nigeria is not successful in cushioning the poor while carrying out energy subsidy reforms through cash transfers to compensate poor households. So there may be a question of physical accountability, but compensating the poor requires infrastructure. In this particular case, for instance, uh, ATM machines, if, even in rural communities, as we saw in Iran, or the collection of benefits using a universal ID system, which is uh, a common practice in India. And Nigeria did not have this in place. So when we discuss just transition, these are the elements we need to touch on. It's not, the effect is not equal for everyone and there are likely people uh, to be left behind as a result. And imagine this is in countries where they are exporting. The impact is even more for countries that are net importers, fuel importers. So where there is uh, poor infrastructure, low level of civil registration of vital statistics and in the absence of reliable, timely and relevant data, policies to cushion the poor during reforms on energy or any other uh, uh, any other reform for that matter are unsuccessful even when there is political will. So this brings me to the vital role uh, data uh, plays in leaving no one behind. The question is, do we even know who are those that are being left behind? Because you need relevant, you need reliable, you need disaggregated data and preferably real or near real-time data, which is crucial for appropriate responses to any crisis, to address needs, to plan better for recovery. And all this after measuring who and how many people are pushed back to extreme poverty or experiencing inequality, marginalization, and exclusion. And more specifically, we need to have disaggregated data by age, by sex, by disability type, and also by geography, even going, moving beyond the urban rural uh, binary. The data needs to be collected using simple and standardized methods to identify factors that are keeping people in extreme poverty or even to identify those factors that are facilitating movement out of extreme poverty. So such level of data allows us to understand and track inequalities 
between countries within borders and across segments of a society. But truly, for data to be meaningful, it should go beyond just disaggregation. It needs to be inclusive. Vulnerable people themselves, those in crisis very well know that they, they know what matter most and they need to break out of crisis. This means including affected communities along the data value chain. From the design of the data collection instrument to the actual data collection analysis and use. But ultimately, whatever level of data one obtains and however inclusive it is, it has to be holding, it has to lead to holding decision makers accountable. So finally, I want to just emphasize that once again, we are tied by challenges, but differentiated by impacts. We need to recognize that. I have given you an example from Africa. For a continent that has no role in a conflict happening somewhere in Europe and little to none engagement in mass consumption of fossil fuels over the last decades, Africa is facing the worst impacts of these uh, challenges through high energy and food prices. It has low coping mechanisms as a result of poor states of institutions, infrastructure, and social safety needs. And hence, new and recurring crises are pushing millions of Af Africans to extreme poverty. I just want to conclude by saying that common challenges do not affect all equally, considering intersectionality of crisis. We need to consider intersectionality when we're discussing about Elenobi principles. Intersectionality, for instance, between food insecurity and protracted humanitarian crisis, or intersectionality between vulnerabilities, as I mentioned earlier, drought and gender, or drought and disability. And the role of timely, relevant, and reliable granular data is huge in defining the narrative around a crisis and the approach of addressing of its differential impacts on a community or sections of a community. Thank you all, and over to you, moderator. Thank you very much, uh, Martha, for these wonderful insights. I think you've already brought up uh, a lot of um, important topics, such as the need for granular, reliable data that is inclusive in itself, and this question of intersectionality. I'm going to introduce our speakers. Uh, so from SDSM Mexico, we have Dr. Ali Ruiz Coronel, from the Universidad Nacional Autónoma de, Mex de Mexico. We have from SDSM Pakistan, Dr. Sulfi Kar Buta from the Aga Khan University. And from SDSM South Africa, we have Professor Heinrich Boldman uh, from the University of Pretoria. I'm going to start with Dr. Ali. I'm going to ask a first question to the three of you, which is very quickly to briefly present uh, your, project, your projects in about five, uh, four to five minutes. Uh, Dr. Ali, please go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is, uh, she just said is Ali Ruiz Coronel, and I am a middle-aged Mexican woman with brown eyes, brown hair, who's wearing spectacles and is sitting in her office. Uh, first of all, I want to censor the thank the organizers of this event for the invitation and to Marta Beckley for the enlightening and inspiring keynote speech. Uh, Dr. Sulfi Garbuda and Heinrich Bowman, it's a great pleasure to share this panel session with you both. The project that we carry on in Mexico and which I will very briefly describe in the following minutes is called the Open Door Clinic, Healthcare for Persons Facing Homelessness in Mexico City. <laughs> So during the COVID-19 pandemic, the already stark exclusion of persons facing homelessness in Mexico City became even starker with the stay-at-home restrictions, as they obviously have no home where to stay. Furthermore, violence against them increased, and the lack of an official identification and proof of residence document made it impossible for them to access screening for detection of COVID, referral to hospital care, and vaccination. So that's the main reason why we implemented the Open Door Clinic. The Open Door Clinic is simply a movable tent placed in public spaces that are known congregation points for homeless people in Mexico City 
in which screening for the detection of COVID-19, referral to hospital care and um, vaccination against COVID-19 were offered to homeless people completely free and uh, with no need of any document other than their consent. The vaccination was carried out by the National Navy and medical students, professors, and other health professionals of the National Autonomous University of Mexico volunteered to provide COVID-19 screening and primary health care. We gather anthropometric indicators such as weight, height, body mass index, body composition, hungry uh, strength, as well as other biomarkers such as blood pressure, glucose, oxygen, saturation, and body temperature. We also offer HIV and STD tests. Apart from the biomedical data, we gather social information. Anthropology, psychology, and sociology students conduct in-depth interviews, thereby creating a brief clinical and social health record, collecting information on people's living conditions, their survival strategies, their experience in accessing healthcare services, and the challenges that they have faced during the pandemic. In those cases where the primary care consultation deems it necessary, arrangements are made between uh, the participating NGOs and Clinica Condesa, which is a public clinic belonging to the local government, to guarantee a secondary level follow-up. Uh, through qualitative research, we found that in the opinion of homeless persons themselves, the lack of access to health care during the pandemic had to do first with lack of information. They didn't know what to do or where to go if they fell unwell. Um, the problem of transport, because they don't use public transport, so if something is too far to walk, they simply don't go. Lack of money, lack of documents, and being discriminated against both by professionals and by uh, other patients. Although our databases is not big enough to uh, make general statements about the homeless population in Mexico City, it does exhibit a prevalence of diabetes, hypertension, HIV, and syphilis, which is necessary to address with further research. On the other hand, we only found five positive cases of COVID-19 among like more than 300 tests. All of them reported to be asymptomatic. So we posed the hypothesis that their microbiome may have been acting as a protective factor against SARS-CoV-2. Therefore, we collected a sample of the microbiome of 60 chronically homeless men. And while well, these samples are currently being analyzed and we expect that they will provide interesting information about how COVID-19 interacts with the human microbiome. This is in general what the Open Door Clinic is about. Thank you very much, um, Ali. What a wonderful uh, project. Um, let's move to our next, uh, our next speaker and we'll start the, the broader questions uh, now. So, uh, Dr. Dr. Bulta, if you want to go next. Well, <clears throat> thank you very much, uh, Maria. And I, I don't have slides, but I'm very happy to tell you about the project that we are engaged in in the context of reaching the unreached in, um, in COVID-19. So the project is a combination of work that we've done with UNICEF and with GIZ in Pakistan and South Asia. And starting off by our work on trying to evaluate the impact of the stringent closures or stringent measures at the early stage of the pandemic on looking at its impact on health services and on education services. When we began the project with UNICEF in the middle of 2020, we were just beginning to see the impact of early closures and widespread restrictions. But we didn't realize that even though the health system might recover a little bit, educational institutional closures in South Asia would continue to the extent that they did in some countries, they lasted well into 2021. And just to give you some figures based on our actual estimation of real health system data from the district health information systems, we believe that there was between a 12 to 13% increase in child mortality because of reduction in indirect services, immunizations, health services from others, and also an increase in reproductive health uh, lag and gap out there. On the education side, the startling figures that we were able to assemble from South Asia indicated that there were potentially 9 million adolescents, a large proportion of which were girls, who dropped out of schools permanently as a consequence of school closures that lasted for a year and a half or two years. That's an absolute travesty. And in a geography where, because of social cultural norms, 
if a young girl, let's say between 16 to 18 years of age is out of school, what would happen? We estimate that proportions of early marriages or marriages under 18 years of age in the region went up significantly. We estimate that there have been close to around 450,000 to 500,000 adolescent pregnancies, excess adolescent pregnancies in that region, which houses one and a half billion people. And this in turn has its own consequence in terms of poor nutrition, increase in the risk of low birth weight and higher rates of stunting in early childhood in the first two years of life, which have an intergenerational impact in terms of outcomes. So with that background uh, and with GIZ support, we set out to also look at what was the evidence around school health and nutrition programs that could potentially mitigate some of these challenges, both in normal settings, as well as during consequences like emergencies. And we did it in two parts. So we undertook a systematic review of evidence from low and middle income countries on what had been the experience of school health and nutrition programs on number one, potential impacts on health, nutrition, and, and education, but also importantly on reaching the marginalized populations. So we were able to assemble what we thought was initially a very large database, but out of good quality studies, there are only about 10 or so that we were able to look at in terms of enhanced education and, uh, and nutrition outcomes. From Bangladesh and Peru, there is some evidence from health and nutrition programs in schools that this impacted primary education completion rates, reduced dropout rates by seven and a half percent, and increased um, uh, uh, attendance and enrollment of students in the intervention schools, particularly for girls. So there was some evidence of a rural benefit. There was evidence of improved practices, but sadly very little in terms of actual nutritional benefit. But across the board in all of these studies from low and middle income countries uh, on health and nutrition interventions in schools, we found no evidence that there was any selective targeting of marginalized populations or importantly of resilience building. And that is really a very important finding that prior to this pandemic, there wasn't a conscious recognition of targeting and reducing inequities through the school and health uh, nutrition programs, uh, particularly those that are based in, in, uh, in uh, low and middle income countries. The, 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 the feeling is that just by placing these programs in rural areas or in poor uh, settings that they would somehow or the other be reaching everybody who should be reached, but the evidence is to the contrary that even within those areas, it reach the more, reaches the, the more well-possessed and the more well-resourced rather than the poorest of the poor. We then pivoted and undertook a scoping review of studies from low and middle income countries between January 2020 and January 2022 on what had actually happened during the pandemic in terms of targeting. And here we had, because of the attention during the pandemic, a larger body of evidence. We had 18 studies that were conducted in these settings. And these studies included a range of approaches uh, that uh, uh, were focused on nutrition and food, health and health services, physical activity, and a few on mental health, although the nutrition and food program interventions were the dominant majority, nine such studies. Uh, uh, the mental health programs were only identified in two studies that had been undertaken and published from low and middle income countries. Now, it is possible some of this data has, is just beginning to come out. And uh, we were reasonably heartened to recognize that these studies had begun to look at how could we reach children who were marginalized, who were dispossessed, or were be belonging to the poorest quintiles in the population. So to round all of this body of work off and experience, as we had set out with GIZ, we make five specific proposals in terms of how one can build resilient health and nutrition and education systems through the school platforms moving forward. The first recommendation is that from the evidence available, this cannot be done just within the education sector. 
And to do this would require multi and intersectoral collaboration among stack stakeholders to develop context specific policies and importantly training at, at uh, school platforms and linked community platforms. Because when schools are closed partially or fully, they have to have some links with the communities. This requires number two, adequate investment in WASH, in protective equipment, particularly during epidemics or pandemics, to ensure that parents and communities feel safe in terms of sending children to schools. We make the resounding, and I am very pleased to say supported by the Lancet Commission recommendation that never again should be ever close schools uh, for particularly the children in the most sensitive age, age groups, the younger children. The third is about money. And we have heard this time and time again over the last three days, that there needs to be a much greater reallocation and distribution of health and nutrition program funding towards adapting programs for interventions that will reach the poor. If there are virtual programs, as has been the norm, and this has become now something which will be perhaps continued even after the pandemic is over, there has to be a strategy for these virtual programs, learning programs to reach the poorest of the poor in community settings, in urban slums, we have to find mechanisms to make that happen. And that does mean that there has to be investment in infrastructure, low cost technology, and linkages with community facilities where children can come, even if you cannot provide that at an individual level and have those learnings. In Pakistan, there was an effort made through television to have a learning channel, but it really was not to the same extent or as effective as we would have thought. The fourth recommendation is to give greater financial autonomy to schools during times of crisis for rapid decision making. And, uh, and that requires redistribution and allocation of existing resources rather than in a pandemic situation, asking for money that may not come within enough time. And lastly, we make a very strong recommendation for robust monitoring and evaluation for looking at what was happening. Even today, two years in plus into the pandemic, we do not have sufficient data on inequities amongst the educational sectors reach into rural population because those data systems were so much dependent upon surveys that regular information systems do not collect that data. So we have, are making a very strong recommendation on m and &E and data collection exercises that can impact both school health nutrition programs and also their reach so that both children out of school and children who drop out of schools can be captured by those systems for policymakers and programs to pivot and make that investment. Thank you very much. I'll stop and I'll be happy to answer questions as we go along. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Buta. Let's move to our next speaker, and indeed, then we'll open the floor for for some questions. So, uh, Professor Heinrich Bollmann, uh, there you are. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. Um, yeah, so the South African uh, team's uh, topic was was quite a bit different. Um, it was not not health and education related at all, although there were some indirect uh, health effects we, we looked at. Uh, in South Africa, the, the topic we looked at was the what we call the, the just energy transition. And, and, and the title of our research was just greening of the South African economy. So it has a lot to do with uh, the South African uh, proposed move of, of uh, getting away from coal-fired electricity generation, which for those who know the South African economy continues to play a large part in our economy, and then of course, then uh, subsequently the emissions. Um, uh, and, and the whole focus of our study was trying to um, look at how this transition away from coal fired generation towards cleaner, more renewable sources uh, is going to impact not just the economy and its various sectors, but also the workers themselves involved in, in those activities which are now changing. Um, so we found, you know, I wouldn't say any surprising results, but certainly they do highlight, um, uh, you know, the whole cause of paying attention to the just transition, right? So our story is very much a, a regional economic story within South Africa. Uh, most of the coal mines and coal-fired power stations are 
heavily concentrated within one of the provinces in South Africa, Mpumalanga, and, and close by regions. And then it's obviously then no surprise that, that these regions are, are most heavily impacted by the transition. Of course, um, it's an impact by design, right? We do need to reduce coal uh, for various reasons. Obviously, we, we understand um, that it's now embedded in science, the health impacts, the climate change, et cetera, right? So it, it's, it's damage we are imposing on an industry and by implication, a region in South Africa by design, right? But we have to take care of the workers within the spirit of the overall leave no one behind principle, right? So what we found and, and the, the challenges uh, we, we see emanating from the economic modeling work we've done is really that a large share of the workers involved um, in the coal mining activities and in this region um, are, are lower paid, lower skilled type of workers, right? And, and labor mobility is extremely limited for this type of worker. Uh, now, often when this type of work is modeled, uh, an economic model will conveniently show over time that these workers can just move to other regions which, which stand to benefit, et cetera, et cetera. But we know in, in reality that that's not the case. And if we model it, accordingly and put these various real world limitations if, if we can put it like that in the model you know the, the damages uh, to these uh, specific uh, labor and occupation groups is is um, really exacerbated and and that's then where the challenge lies for south africa is, is how can we in a sense protect and assist these workers through this transition right because again it's easy for an economic model to show okay uh, in the in the medium term even things play out well but you know, workers can't go a week without money and food, et cetera, et cetera, right? So we can't even for the shortest uh, time window allow people to be left behind. Um, and, and that's the challenge I think our work highlights. Unfortunately, one of the, uh, you know, I think one of the, the nice things about our study, uh, I would say the, the, the main event, if I can call it that, is only happening in two days. We're having a big round table discussion with many policymakers and, and role players in this uh, transition space, who, who, who um, you know, the point of this roundtable is to talk about a lot of the on the ground issues and limitations happening in this transition. Because again, uh, it's easy to set up policy documents and, and run economic models, and, and things uh, doesn't look too bad then. But there's a lot of real world constraints and limitations that that we want to know more of, and make sure to include in our study. Uh, but in short, just to summarize, it, it's, it's um, this uh, energy transition happening in South Africa has some significant challenges at a regional level within South Africa, given the concentration of the coal mining sector we are trying to move away from. And given the poor labor mobility of these workers, that's really where the leave uh, no one behind uh, principle is, is really, um, uh, you know, that's where the challenges lie for South Africa and, and the design of policy and the right investment in, in human and physical capital going forward. I'll uh, leave it there and we'll be happy to take questions on this. Thanks. Thank you very much. I'm going to pick up on this last uh, uh, question that you've just raised. No? How, how can we bring the the conclusions of this research and some of the recommendations that you've made to policymakers for uh, for implementation and i'm going to open the floor for the three of you um just to ask you what is the potential that you see of using the results of this research and uh, and of these recommendations and implementing them into into concrete policies um, but then also, what are some of the challenges and some of the nuances, as you've mentioned right now, uh, Heinrich, what are some of the nuances that can make this implementation uh, difficult? Um, I don't know if any one of you wants to take the floor. Uh, look, I'll be happy to quickly continue on. Um, you know, I think in South Africa, there's always been a, a, a big... Um, it's called a mismatch between very nicely written policy documents and ideas, uh, but taking that through to the implementation stage. Um, that seems to at least where we have struggled, and I know many other developing countries uh, similarly struggle to, to go from a, a planning phase into the implementation phase. And, 
And of course, there's various reasons for it, from technical reasons all the way through to horrible corruption stories that uh, limit our ability to be effective with our scarce resources. Um, so we've never had a shortage of ideas and beautifully written policy documents. The, the challenge really for specifically South Africa lies in implementing this good policy. And, and also, if I may add, it's, it's you know, the real world challenge often with the, the leave now well and behind principle is that um, if you're in a, a current, let's call it baseline scenario of very low growth, combined with already high unemployment, as is the case in South Africa, we have shockingly high unemployment. And if we're just focusing in on the region of question here, where all the, the coal mines are in Pumalanga province, they've got an expanded unemployment rate of 48%, right? So now the problem with any kind of transition is that usually there are unavoidable short run adjustment costs to deal with, right? Um, even though in the medium to longer run, it's typically a good news story, uh, often there are some short-term challenges in the adjustment process. And if you're already in a scenario of very low growth and high unemployment, it, it makes it incredibly difficult to absorb any kind of adjustment cost. And, and that's part of the reason why uh, implementation has been so kind of slow is, is because that implementation requires a bit of space for the adjustment to happen. And if you're already in this slow growth, high unemployment uh, environment, it, it makes it very difficult for policymakers to go ahead and, and implement some of the changes that we know are very necessary from an environmental and health perspective in terms of greening the economy. But uh, the jobs that might be lost, even a few in, in the very short run, seems to be a, a bit of a stumbling block. Thank you. Um, Ali, do you want to go next? I'll be happy to follow. Thank you, yes. Well, I would like to bond on what Marta Beckley said in her speech at the beginning. I think that we don't know who is left behind and what are the specific mechanisms in which they are left behind. So uh, homelessness is something which is uh, not very well understood. And I think that uh, generating the data, uh, trustable data is uh, very important. Um, I think that the pandemic showed that very clearly in Mexico City. Uh, um, as many other cities, the local government response to the emergency was to increase the capacity of public shelters to the homeless and to turn stadiums into temporal shelters for the homeless. But the insufficient or even wrong data about the total amount of persons facing homelessness in Mexico City led to an underestimation of the resources needed. So as early as the 14th of May of 22, I mean, it's like one month later after the pandemic crisis was declared, the local government announced that shelters for the homeless were closed. And after having reached their maximum capacity of 2,325 places. What is, uh, I don't know, incredible is that uh, that same year, the national census counted only 1,226 persons being homeless in Mexico City. So we can see that Obviously, no uh, efficient policy can be made when the data is not correct. No, so uh, I think that the project that we uh, are uh, taking, are, are conducting, is important in that sense. We are um, conducting very qualitative data, face-to-face -face data, taking uh, in account what people say uh, that is their problem and also what their suggestions are of the mechanisms to overcome them. Uh, I think that um, with vulnerable populations, there is a prevalence of statistics and big numbers and uh, qualitative research is the one that is needed for these populations to be properly addressed. Thank you very much. Sophie, do you want to go next? Yeah. So uh, let me try and summarize what our own learning has been from this exercise. And um, there are a few things which are very heartwarming. One is that globally people are beginning to discover the middle childhood. You know, for a long time in global health, uh, school age children just did not exist outside of the education system. We thought that their health problems were minimal. It took a pandemic to tell people how important it was to address mental health issues, other physical health issues, nutrition issues in these children. 
And that only got highlighted because many of them were locked up um, uh, at home with families. So I'm very pleased to say that both at the level of the World Health Organizations and potentially, hopefully, in collaboration with UNESCO, there will be a lot more focus on developing what I call resilient, equitable school health and nutrition platforms. Now, what that means and how that will be operationalized is something that we need to see. As was asked in the chat by somebody, I would like very much to see those school health and nutrition programs be much more uh, green, stable, focused on also living and working in the context of climate change and bringing that recognition and knowledge into that platform that's very important. Second point that I would like to raise is that we're all beginning to discover the limits of our existing data collection system, the district information system, whether they relate to health and or education, in that how poor they are in terms of targeting and reaching the unreached. So we do not collect sufficiently disaggregated or geographically uh, tagged data that allows us to leave nobody behind. So we don't have sufficient information in many districts on who are the marginal, who are the children who are not coming to school? Do they belong to a particular ethnic group, a particular caste? Are the children living in the Kachi, let's say riverine areas as we are beginning to discover as a consequence of the floods in Pakistan? Who are these marginalized people? And in order to reach them, do you, do you need to take services to them or do you need to bring them closer to services? So geographic targeting is something that I hope programs will realize both for health and education. And I think this will be a, a phenomenal way forward. And it can be done with a lot less expenditure, in my opinion, than we have had through traditional systems. The third point that I would like to make is that it's very clear that the eye does not see what the mind does not know that recognizing some of these issues in the context of building resilient schools, and importantly, resilient schools and health and nutrition systems will require resources. Now, how do you, it becomes mind boggling as I was discussing with Jeff Sachs earlier this morning, for a country like Pakistan, which has struggled to negotiate a one and a half billion dollars loan with the world, with the IMF over the last one year almost, just to lose 30, 40 billion dollars of infrastructure, including over two and a half thousand schools in the current floods, everything else fails in its way. So we also need some kind of a resilient system that is impervious to disasters. Now that will make, require national planning, disaster planning, rebuilding schools, which are to some extent resilient to not only floods and other aspects of climate change to earthquakes in the North. So rebuilding better, fairer, and also in a manner that we can have a greater sense of knowledge as to who are the people that we are trying to reach and how we will be measure success in a couple of years is something that we need to do as a global community. So I hope that answers some of the questions. Uh, Maria, if there's anything else, I'll be happy to tackle it. I think absolutely. And I think you've brought up another question that has been asked in the chat and that Marta mentioned uh, in her speech, the importance of knowing who are the ones that are being left behind. So we need data that is uh, disaggregated, that is granular. Um, but there are a lot of challenges, including capacity to access and uh, and to analyze and 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 uh, process data. What would you say? What are some of your recommendations uh, on how to better understand, how to increase, in your own words, the knowledge of who are uh, the ones being left behind? I'm asking the three panelists. And just as a follow-up question, uh, how much do you think some of the recent innovations and uh, on using citizens' data and self-reporting and uh, mobile technologies and so could help uh, address this question of the knowledge of who is being left behind? So maybe I can I can go first this time. So I think there is tremendous scope here. And uh, and I'll tell you, you know, so my friend Seth Berkeley at Gavi said famously, we know that every fifth child in the world isn't immunized. But we don't think that the fifth child is standing right next to the fourth child. 
So finding and recognizing who these children are who are being left behind is a very important part of health and immunization systems. We know that from polio. Just finding children who are unimmunized or not immunized has been a big task. Similarly, finding children who are unenrolled in school, who disproportionately drop out, who are, in fact, not even benefiting from the existing systems is extremely important. I believe that rather than base things on the traditional way of data collection through household visits or periodic surveys every four or five years, which nobody can afford, and do not actually find their way into health and information systems rapidly, we need to increasingly move to technology that is within our grasp. During the floods of Pakistan in the last four to five months, one of the most useful ways of recognizing which are the pockets and people and, and areas which have been maximally affected are geospatial technologies, uh, remote sensing, also use of satellite imaging. And I think some of these technologies as they come on board, allow you to get a better sense of where to place these facilities in the future also. So, so Maria, I completely agree. Use some, using some of the handheld cell phone based technologies, uh, using technologies that allow you to localize things, including geotag your information, and, and also creating that linkage between information systems. We currently have a problem because the health system does not speak to the education system, which do not speak to the social protection system. So we have these parallel information systems that exist across sectors, but they don't talk to each other. They sometimes use completely insensitive technologies also. So creating a platform whereby you can have a smooth translation of information across sectors, I think will be a huge step forward. We have granular information in Pakistan from the income support program. One of the best poverty related household data, but it is not available to the health system folks and vice versa. Thank you. Thank you very much. Heinrich and Ali, do you want to make a very brief? Uh... Well, I will briefly say that uh, as my project shows, I think that students and professors and linking uh, scholars and academics to solving problems is one of the very uh, probable options to, to knowing uh, who is being left behind them. And, and thesis are written, research is done. So it's just as, as Dr. Sofia said, just to join different areas of, of knowledge that is being produced in different parts. In the South African case of the, the energy transition, um, we have a pretty good idea of who is um, being left behind, um, uh, both from an economic modeling point of view and, and just on the ground. Uh, and various other institutions and researchers have also looked into this. Um, our challenge is, is more to do with a proper implementation of various plans and finding the fiscal space uh, to implement that. And then also, you know, the political will to uh, to go forward with uh, these various uh, interventions. Um, you know, and, and then it's also a case of, of um, making sure how to deal with those identified as, as potentially affected, not necessarily left behind, but we know that they will be affected by the transition and, and freeing up the funds for various retraining and reskilling and, and potential uh, labor mobility uh, challenges they may face. So, uh, that, that's that's definitely the challenges in the South African transition case. Thank you. Um, there's one other question that I think is very relevant to to this discussion in the chat, which is, um, what's the role of indigenous knowledge, <clears throat> both in identifying uh, who is being left behind, but then also in thinking about strategies to to address these vulnerabilities and to ensure that they're not being left behind. And I would also like to invite, invite Marta to, uh, to answer this question if she, if she wants to. Um, we have five minutes left, so if anyone has any thoughts, if you could summarize it in just one minute or two, that would be great. I think you've said it before, Maria, like this fixation on official data. Uh, that is uh, collected by only statistics bureau is the most reliable one. You know, uh, there are people uh, who are living in crisis. You've just spoken about indigenous people. 
who, who understand better their situation and they know the factors that are keeping them in crisis or in poverty, how are we involving them? As, as you mentioned earlier, there are so many um, ways of collecting data these days. Citizens are actively involved. So working together, civil societies, development organizations and statistics offices, how do they come together to work, um, to identify standard methods and involving people uh, in the whole data value chain? How are you going to? I've just given an example of, for instance, when you are, uh, when the Kenya government was collecting data on disability, they started counting only uh, from five years and above for a reason. Um, of course, they were able to explain that, but are we involving uh, disability organizations or organizations of persons with disabilities? Are enumerators well trained? Are people synthesized, for instance, to supply that information? Uh, how are we involving organizations of persons with disabilities in the collection of data, in the design of the data collection, in the analysis, in the use, in the dissemination? So the whole value chain, we need to integrate people whom uh, we are working for. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marta. Um, I don't know if anyone else wants to make a brief uh, remark on this point. Otherwise, we'll start closing uh, the session because we only have two minutes left. Um, let me just tell all of the participants that uh, have joined us today that we are not, uh, the process of these research grants is not done. So we've heard from these three phenomenal speakers about these super in interesting projects that are ongoing. Um, we will make an official launch of the, of the results of these papers that will be made available at SDSN's website. So we encourage you to stay tuned for, for these uh, results that will be coming shortly. Um, and we will organize, as I say, uh, an event to discuss the final uh, results. Um, until then, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, as you know, ICSD continues throughout the day today, so there are many other exciting sessions happening uh, later. Uh, check our uh, agenda and our schedule and make sure to sign up for, for them. Thank you very much for, for your participation. Thank you, Marta, uh, for joining us today and for your insights, as well as last year's project. Uh, Solfi, Ali, and Heinrich, thank you for sharing this uh, snippet of, uh, of your work. We look forward to the final resort, results. And once again, thank you very much, uh, GIZ and, uh, and BMZ for their support to this work and to SDSN's uh, work throughout these years. Um, Thank you. See you all soon uh, and have a very good day. Thank you. Good day.